Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness.
slander, loss of lies to no end. They go with the crowd, unknowingly descend. They believe that the lights, the dawn that their Into your hands, I commit my spirit. She came to the tombs looking for his grave. And she found the place where they said the Lord did lay.
Jesus Christ. They trampled out his spirit, I'll feel it and proclaim. This is the Son of God, I'll consume fire pain. Proceeding from his mouth, holes of fire they did blaze. He pointed all the heavens, mounted the cherubim, dark clouds under his feet. He soared upon the wind, and he teaches my
Welcome everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom Kalamantos. Shabbat Shalom Flo. Shabbat Shalom Billy. Stephanie. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. Welcome. Shabbat Shalom Randy. Good to see you. Love. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Awesome. Good to see you. Welcome. Shabbat Shalom Cuberts. Shabbat Shalom. Seek the Lord. Flo, thank you. Flo says, Fanta fantastic job, Christopher and Ben. Thank you. So we got drunk. Uh, where is it here? For some reason, this doesn't work. Over on Twitch says, don't, I don't know much about Jesus, but the music seems nice. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Cubert says, this is powerful. Thank you for, to the whole band. Thank you, Cuberts. Flo says, beautiful. Thank you, Flo. And Calamento says, encore. Encore. You know, about a month ago or so, I wrote this song called Let My People Go. You know that freedom has been in the balance recently. And I could picture like a multitude of people from horizon to horizon marching innumerable people marching and singing this song so let's do it let's do it guys let's do it let's do let my people go We are saved, we are called, we are on the rise. We are here, in your midst, we are on God's side. You oppressed, you ignored, persecuted us. We have called on our God, he will not avenge us. Let my people go.
Well, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changer, world changers. Hope you're having an awesome, awesome evening, or I should say, t day today. Uh, I'm used to saying evening so much because we're going live usually in the evenings, but once a week we go live in the day, such as this. So, welcome everyone. Tonight, oh my God, thank you, today, um, we are going to be talking about humility, one of the most important virtues. I think it's one of the, it, I think it's like the heartbeat or the, the bloodline, if you will, uh, of the faith. You know, it says in the scriptures, uh, I'm going to pull this up here. We got in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? That's a good question. What does the Lord require of you? What does God want you to do? What does God, what does God want from you? To do justly, and this word justly in the Hebrew is talking about righteousness, being a Sadiq, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God. Not pridefully, humbly with your God. So do righteousness, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is what it says. This is what God requires of us. It is just absolutely amazing. So this is why we're going to talk about this today. I think that almost every problem, a good part of the problems in the world today, in the church today, is because of pride and arrogance. Lack of humility. You need to be humble. And uh, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, a a variety of scriptures all the way from Genesis all the way through to the New Testament talking about humility. If you know of anybody that would be interested in listening to this, share the live stream if you haven't already. If you have already, maybe you might want to send them a reminder. Hey, knock, knock. Uh, how about coming on now? You know, send them a reminder and, uh, and let's get everybody on board. Yeah. So, as always, I pray that everything that we share here today would be a great blessing to you. Increase your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of the things of heaven, your relationship with God, and your knowledge of the truth. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so uh, I greeted some of you already uh, earlier while we were doing the music. Let's see what else we have here. Let's finish it. Let's finish it says, Shalom, Shalom, let's finish it. Welcome and blessings, blessings multiplied to you. Calamento says, superb job, y'all. Thank you. And Cuberts, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So, right off the bat, we have found that, we find that it is God's desire. It's one of the basic fundamentals of walking with God is to be humble. One of, the, one of the three big great pillars of the requirements that the Lord has for you to walk humbly with your God. So, let's start. Uh, I want to start with Genesis, but I want, to, I want to preface Genesis with 1 John chapter 2. I think this is important. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we're going to talk about this here, the pride of life. So I call this the trinity of sin. Right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So pride, this is what we're talking about today, uh, specifically humility, but in order for us to understand and appreciate the value of humility, we need to understand what pride is as well. In order to value the light, we need to know what darkness is, right? So let's start with Genesis chapter 3, right? Coming right, going right back to the very beginning. Actually, let's start with Genesis chapter 2, okay? I'm sorry. Let's start with Genesis chapter 2. 
give it a little bit of background here. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Then we're going to skip on over to Genesis chapter 3. Again, just to give a little bit of context behind this story. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree, every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Okay. So let's skip on over to Genesis chapter 3. So we got that command in there. In other words, so again, just to reiterate, God said to Adam, you can eat of every tree. Just, just not this one. That's all. Of every tree you can eat, except for this one, this one here. I do believe this is figurative, by the way. I don't believe these are literal trees. However, that's besides the point. That's not really pertinent to the, uh, to the message here today. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. You got to wonder, did God make him cunning? Did God make him cunning? Just a question. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat from every tree of every tree of the garden? Okay, so you see what happened here. The cunning serpent lied because God said, you can eat from every tree of the garden, except this one. But then the serpent comes around to Eve. Now, remember also in context as well, God spoke to Adam and gave him this commandment about the, you know, you can eat of every tree except this one, before Eve was created. So Eve did not receive that commandment directly from God. She received it through Adam. So the serpent knew not to go straight to Adam because God spoke directly to Adam, not to Eve. So he, the serpent went to Eve. And again, he twisted it upside down. He inverted it. Like God did say you can eat from every tree of the garden, just, just not this one. So... So he twists it. He, can, he makes it really, really confusing. Has God indeed said you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Eve should have answered, no, God, not, God did not say that. God said you can eat from every tree of the garden except for this one. That's all. That's how Eve should have answered. So Eve said in verse 2, Eve said to the serpent, we may eat from the, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Now look, look at this. God did not say not to touch it. There's a lot of speculation here as to uh, why Eve put that in there. You know, we don't know for sure. We don't know where she got this from. Maybe she made it up. Maybe, she, maybe her memory was... Not all that good at that. Maybe she kind of inserted that in her in there herself. Uh, there is some theories that Adam actually made it up. Excuse me. Adam uh, gave that extra commandment to Eve. So, in other words, Adam really didn't trust her that much. He, he just like, okay, uh, God said, don't don't eat of it and don't even touch it. Don't even touch it. Okay. I don't know if that's what really happened. I don't know. However, I do know it doesn't say that God said you should not touch it. The commandment not to touch it is not a thing. We don't have that command in, in, you know, in Genesis chapter 2 at all. Anywhere's in Genesis for that matter. So if Adam, I say if Adam did add that extra stipulation in there, that extra commandment in there, then he was the first one to sin because it is a sin to add to the law of God. It is a sin to add to the law of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 makes that very clear. Since we're talking about it, let's just do a little 
hop, skip, and a jump over there. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So, again, just for the sake of talking about it, there is a theory out there. Some people believe, and I do understand this is in the, in the Jewish realm, okay? Some of the Jewish scholars and sages believe that Adam actually gave her that command added to the Torah. If that's the case, Adam was the first one to sin, not Eve. Adam sinned before all this stuff happened, if, that, if that's the case. Uh, either way, Eve said to, to, uh, to, the, to the serpent that God said not to touch it. Well, that's not true either, lest you die. Verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day... You eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Okay. So here we find the trinity of sin. The woman saw that the fruit, the fruit, or that the tree was good for food. This is the lust of the flesh. You say, what do you mean, lust of the flesh being the good? Well, you know, it says in Hebrews chapter twelve that Esau was a fornicator, although it was not in a conventional way of being a fornicator. If you if you know what I mean, I don't want to cause any. Uh, I don't want to cause any red flags here on the, on, the, uh, on the platforms. So he was a fornicator by valuing food over the blessings of God. Valuing food over the word of God. You see? Because he sold his birthright for food. And, and the birthright of Esau was everything. That was the, the, the birthright was the blessings of Abraham. Was, it was everything. It was it was salvation. It was everything. So Esau became a fornicator, not in the way that you would think he would, and normally how we, people use this term, but by food. So this is the lust of the flesh here, good for food, and was pleasant to the eyes. Of course, this is obviously the lust of the eyes. And then we have a tree desirable to make one wise. Now, I believe this is talking about the pride of life. There are two kinds of wisdom. You know, it talks about this in the book of James. We have the earthly wisdom and we have the heavenly wisdom. We have the carnal wisdom and we have the spiritual wisdom. I don't believe this is talking about spiritual wisdom here. I think that it, this is talking about carnal, worldly, earthly wisdom. So this kind of puffed up her pride. Oh, desirable to make me wise. You know, it... it to know more. And this is what happens a lot. There is a good knowledge in a way, and then there, are, there, is a, there is a type of knowledge and wisdom that will cause people just to be puffed up instead of, instead of uh, being built up. Instead of being uh, built up or supported and built in the knowledge of the Lord and the ways of the Lord, they're built up in themselves. So this is the pride of life. So right from the very beginning, we see that pride was one of the great factors that worked into the fall. One of the great factors that worked in the, into the fall was the pride of life. She was, Eve was lured in by this kind of, you know, to obtain this kind of pride and arrogance through carnal knowledge. You might say, well, this is talking about knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, we, we spoke about this a few days, um, the other night, and uh, here's the, the, the problem with this is that it's not very clear as to what this quote-unquote tree was and how it applied and what it looked like, so to speak. What I mean is this. I know that some people think that, you know, that God just didn't, like they take it in a very 
superficial, very surface-like interpretation of it. Like, just look at it for what it looks like, for what it looks like it says to us in, our, in the 21st century. Uh, I tend to go along the lines of saying, well, this knowledge may not be what you think it is. It may not be head knowledge. It may be talking about experiential knowledge, like how it says Adam knew Eve. Or, you know, this man knew this woman, you know, like, and so there's this, it just says new or this knowledge that, that, uh, that means intimate engagement with. So the knowledge of good and evil is like, oh, you, you can do righteousness and you can do evil too kind of thing. Like, so it, it may mean that. So let's not. Let's not, uh, you know, discount some of these things. A good way of, 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 uh, of reading and interpreting the scriptures is to be humble and to admit that you may not be interpreting it correctly. There may be things out there that you do not know. That's why it says in the scriptures to listen, to be slow to speak and to be fast to listen. Thomas says, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Thomas. Welcome. Blessings. Thomas, uh, 1 John 2, 16. Yes, we just got finished reading that just a few minutes ago. Yes, the Trinity of Sin. I just I just said that. Yeah, it was just, just a few minutes ago, Thomas. Thank you. Blessings, blessings. I hope all is well with you. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, all right. I want to look at this topic from various viewpoints instead of just looking at okay you know uh, what did god say about humility and pride but some examples of it so here we got an example of the you know the story of the fall of man so to speak how they say it. the story of the fall of adam and eve uh, we have an example of how these fell into pride let's look at the other side of the the, the coin Let's look at those who have been very humble. I can't think of any better story to illustrate humility than the story of Joseph. Let's go on over to Genesis. Chapter 30, uh, is this it, 37, let's just start there. Uh, so this is from what we had earlier, First John chapter 2, Genesis. Let's start with uh, Genesis chapter 37, Joseph's dreams of greatness. Yeah, so we know, you know the story, Joseph had dreams and God uh, regularly speaks through dreams, right? God shows us his will and his ways and all that kind of stuff, what he has for us in our future through dreams and such. Joseph sold by his brothers. Okay, so let's start with this right here. Genesis chapter 37, verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their, their father's flocks in Shechem. So, so in, in context here, Joseph is in Shechem. And uh, Joseph had, you know, 11 brothers, uh, this, uh, all the sons of Jacob slash Israel. So it says here, verse 13, And Israel said to Joseph, so this would be Jacob, Israel, said to Joseph, Are, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and, sent him, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where, I, where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I have heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. 
So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. <laughs> Some brothers those are, you know. Some brothers those are, uh, I got to say. They conspired against him to kill him. Look, here comes Joseph. Let's kill him now. Um, verse 13. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come now, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. I will say this. I know this is kind of like a little sidetrack, a little bit of a like collector's lane here, okay? Uh, off the side. Uh, outside the story. I do believe that the story of Joseph is very much a parallel uh, to that of Yeshua. So Yeshua, it's like his quote-unquote family, if you will, being the uh, his own people, okay? The children of Israel. They wanted to do him in. We all know that talks about that in the, in the Gospels that they, that they tried to they tried to do him in a, a number of times. And they finally did, you know, crucified him. Cast him into some pit. So this is symbolic of the grave. 21, verse 21. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Reuben was, was good this way. Verse 23. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, they, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. So this is, again, this is, this, is rem this is parallel, in my opinion, to what they did with Jesus. You see all the statues and the drawings and paintings and such and the, the crucifixes of Jesus wearing this little, this little, you know, what do you call it? Towel around his, not towel, but napkin, uh, cloth around his waist. In fact, from what I understand, he didn't wear anything. They literally stripped him naked, not a stitch on him. Just like Joseph here. The tunic of many colors. So, yeah, you can say, well, Jesus didn't have a quote-unquote tunic of many colors per se, but he had a seamless robe, which, as far as I understand, was a very valuable gov uh, garment, like how a tunic of many colors would be a, a very valuable and uh, uh, what did you say? Um, extraordinary, extraordinary garment. Not like everybody had a seamless robe like Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know this, and I know I, I, we spoke about this a couple times before in the past, but let's let's do this again. You know, there is a church in Germany, I believe it is, that claims to have the seamless robe of Jesus. Uh, am I, do I believe this is? Uh, I, can't, I can't say. It, there's, a, there's a possibility it is. There's a possibility this is the actual robe. Uh, I don't see any evidence either way, whether it's evidence um, for or against this actually being the robe. However, Apparently, many people do because people go from all over the world to visit this place in Germany that is displaying the seamless robe of Jesus. This is it right here. You know, you, th you see in the movies, the first time I saw this, I'm thinking, oh, it's, it's brown. Well, it could have, you know, browned over time. But you see in the movies that, um, uh, you know, Jesus is always wearing like a white you know, robe and looking so, you know, like a, like a quasi angel. But, you know, I think it's very possible that, that it wasn't white. 
It's very possible that Jesus did not wear a white garment like how you see in the movies. I think it's possible that he wore something similar to this color. Uh, I think that this problem uh, more, almost certainly has discolored over the past 2,000 years. Uh, but I thought I'd just bring this to your, you guys' attention anyway. That there, you know, they, they do have, um, there is such a thing as, is this place where you can go and visit this. And apparently they believe, they have evidence that this is actually the seamless robe of Jesus. Back to Genesis 37. So it's, it's, it's similar. Like Joseph had a very special tunic. Jesus did too. They, then they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Okay. So in Jesus, how, say, how could, how could this apply to Jesus? Well, you know, they, they crucified him. They put him into a grave and it was empty. It was, wasn't used. It wasn't a used grave. Verse 25. This is Genesis 37, 25. And they sat down to eat a meal. When they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with the camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh uh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal, conceal his blood? Now keep in mind, Judas, Judas, as in the great betrayer, if I could call him that, uh, of Yeshua, Judas, you know, Judas Iscariot. Do you know Judas's real name was Judah or Yehuda? Judas is just the Greek. It's the Greek transliteration of Judah or Yehuda. Same name. Judas, Judah. Same name. So Judah, or you could say Judas, said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him. See how Judas sold Jesus, right? For the silver. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Soldier of Yahweh, can we also do a little bit of reading in Deuteronomy 30? Um, well, I, I, I often read this. There's a lot of content that we have in, on Deuteronomy 30. I read it so many times. Uh, however, I will, I can't promise you uh, if we have time at the end. I, I don't foresee that we have time, but if we do, we will. Or we can do this another night, Soldier of Yahweh. This is a special live stream about humility. Unless you think that Deuteronomy 30 is talking about humility specifically. Elemento says, I don't think the common people dyed their clothes. That's a good point. Soldier of Yahweh, the Bible says Jesus' robe was scarlet. Can you, can you present um, book, chapter, and verse on, on saying that there was a scarlet robe that was the same robe as the seamless robe? Can you, can you present a book, chapter, and verse on that? I want to see it where it says this is a scarlet seamless robe or something something to that effect.
soldier of Yahweh. As far as I understand, the the robe you're talking about is not the same robe. It's not the same robe. Yeah, it's not the same robe. And we we uh, we spoke about all of these things when it comes uh, when we did our special series on the book of Matthew. We spoke about all these things and we compared it with the other gospels. So. Uh, it is uh it is it, it the details are contrary uh contradictory between matthew uh and uh, the other gospels especially in the see even the color is contrary but this is from what i understand um A scarlet robe would be symbolic of sin. A soldier of Yahweh says, was this seamless robe you're speaking about, the same robe uh, the Romans put on him before crucifixion? No, I do not believe it was. I understand that that was a different robe if it indeed happened. Again, if you were to check out the the uh, the series on Matthew, you'll find we we dig deep into those verses in Matthew uh, and uh, and compare them with the other gospels, and you'll be you'll be surprised how it's different uh, to the point of being co contradictory. So Matthew, we know that Matthew likes to add things uh, and make things up. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Yes, seek the Lord the soldiers, put a scarlet robe on him. Yes, according to Matthew, yes. Uh, according to uh, another source it was it was purple which is different from scarlet uh, however I, I understand this is a different garment this was just a garment to put on him to mock him but the seamless robe was his everyday clothing that they took off of him they stripped him of of his clothing ali says Shalom, salam to all brothers and sisters. Yes, sh shalom, salam. Good to see you. Welcome, peace multiplied to you. Seek the Lord says yes. Yes. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So I know this is kind of like not the We're getting into a lot of details here. Uh, Ge Genesis chapter 37, verse 27, come let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. So again, this is Judas that said this, and or Judah slash Judas. Uh, um, verse 28, then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, soldier of Yahweh says, uh, Matthew says it's scarlet and Mark and John says it's purple. Yes, that's, that's one of the little discrepancies in, in the Gospels there. Thank you, soldier of Yahweh. So... Joseph was dealt a, a, a very bad way, in a very bad way from his brothers. There's no record of him getting angry. There's no record of him holding a grudge so far. He was humble. And this is one of the things about being humble. A person that's humble is not easily offended. A person who's proud, a person who is proud, there's a lot of pride, there's a lot of arrogance. So fragile. These people are so fragile. They're so easily offended. You want to make somebody strong? Make them humble. You want to make some, somebody weak? Feed them pride. They get weak. 
Humility is, is the strength. I'm going to say something. I want to be very careful in what I say here. I'm not a doctor, but I will say this as a disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. Okay, I have not. I'm not professionally trained in psychology or you know, I'm a psychiatrist or anything like this. But I will say this as as something that I have observed. I believe that some, I'm not going to say all, but some people who, have suffer, who are suffering from mental illness is lacking humility. I think that one of the things that makes them so fragile me mentally is the lack of humility. If any of you think that I'm wrong, Please let me know. However, I'm just sharing what I have seen over the years. A lot of people that are very, very arrogant, or they have this sense of pride in them. Really, like, like sometimes it's just like spiritual pride kind of stuff, you know? And so these people are prone. I've seen that there's a lot of people that are more apt to suffering uh, mentally, emotionally in, in this way. Ali says, I like how you put it. Thank you, Ali. I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm doing my best. All right, back to the story of Joseph. We're talking about humility. And I think that we can see humility in Joseph. And this is really what it's all, it's all about. I don't want to get too much on any different rabbit trail here, but I think we can see humility in Joseph. Even though he had his dreams and he shared his dreams, somebody might say, well, that's pride. Well, we don't know his, you know, the, the motivation behind that. It may have been something that God wanted him to, to share, you know, and, and more, more than likely, yes, and that, this is why we have it in the scriptures. So, not that he did it in an arrogant way or, you know, a prideful way. Moving on with the story, Genesis chapter 37, verse 29. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit. And he tore his clothes. And so this is a, a, an act of, of grief, sorrow. Oh man, what happened, to, what happened to our brother Joseph? And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I... Where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in blood. And they sent the tunic of many colors. And they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without, without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, For I shall go down to the grave for, uh, to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Can you imagine what his sons, the brothers of Joseph, must have been thinking and feeling during this time? Now the Midianites sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Genesis chapter 38. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw, okay, so this is kind of like a little bit off the beaten track of the story of Joseph here. Uh, so you know, here's a question. Here's a question. And this is a question that I have. Would this story somehow symbolize 
or be a parallel to, to Judas in any way. In any way, any figure, any kind of symbolism or meta metaphoric meaning. Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites and had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and, and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and, and, said, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment and sa saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of, of the house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought... He has brought in to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted up, that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment and uh, with her until his master came home. Then she spoke with him or to him with words like these, saying, "The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me." And so it happened as I lift, lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. And so it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison and a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Prisoners' dreams. So, so far we have jo Joseph who was horribly treated by his brothers, sold as a slave, framed by Potiphar's wife. Yet we have no even aroma of, of being offended, that he wasn't offended, that he was, he was humble through it all. We have no even implication that he was angry. I picture Joseph as a man who was very, very humble and trusted God all the way. Like, God, whatever happens to me, I know you're in charge and I know that things will work out for the best. I know you're with me. I know your blessing is on me. So whatever happens to me, whoever does whatever they do to me, I'm going to trust God that you are going to bring me out on top in the end. Regardless, 
not holding a grudge. And that's another thing about humility as well. Humility gives us the power to forgive and not hold a grudge. Pride, again, is so very destructful because it makes us so fragile. We can be angry so easily, so quickly. I don't think this is the way, this is not the way that, that our Creator is. He doesn't get angry so hastily. Voice of one over in TikTok, welcome, blessings, blessings multiplied to you. Genesis chapter 40, and it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king offended their Lord. Well, there you go. Offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in, in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and served, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the, of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came in to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were, who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We, have, we each have, have uh, had a dream. And there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told, the, told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe, ripe grapes, then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will, be, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me, but remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also, I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Pharaoh, I also was, was in was in my dream, and there were three baskets, white baskets on my head. In the up, uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So, so Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in, in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Another huge injustice done to Joseph. So this is like number three. Huge. Ver, uh, Genesis chapter th uh, 41. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold... Seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. 
He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then, behold, seven thin, thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh and said, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants, he put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass just as he interpreted for us. So it happened. He restored to me my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothes, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I've heard it, it said of you that you can understand a dream and to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt. Such ugliness I've never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven cows, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as in the beginning. So I awoke. Also I saw in my dream, this, and suddenly seven heads came up, on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads withered and thin, and blighted with the east wind, sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. Notice, this is always what you see, what happens. When you have two dreams of similar nature, it's, it's very significant. Very significant. When you have two dreams, similar in nature, it's very significant. Pay special attention. Then Joseph, it says in verse 25, said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. In other words, they both mean the same thing. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Wow. Verse 33. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then 
that food shall shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during famine so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants and Pharaoh said to his servants can we find such a one as this a man in whom is the spirit of God by the by the way People were filled with the Spirit of God long before Acts chapter 2. This is one example. Bezalel is another example. There are others. Verse 39, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. So this is, this is similar to the story of Yeshua. His brothers threw him into a pit, so to speak, into the grave. You know, he was sold by Judah slash Judas. He had this special garment on. Uh, he spent some time, quote unquote, in the prison. He was betrayed. And then when the, when the right time came, he, ra- he, was, he rose. And now at the right hand of the Father, just as Joseph was at the right hand of Pharaoh, and that God, well, Pharaoh gave Joseph everything except for the, the throne of Pharaoh. It's, it, basically everything except for the actual throne that Pharaoh was sitting on. Like the highest authority. In the same way, you could say that God gave Jesus all this authority. Second only to that of God himself, God the Father. Very, very important. So, read a little bit more here to see the the humility of Joseph how he did not take offense at any of this stuff so he was forgotten for at least 2 years in prison even though he told the butler remember me just remember you think the butler would remember him like be thinking about him all the time since of that wonderful word of god and the interpretation of the dream and how it came to pass and but the, I mean, so Joseph was left for dead, sold as a slave, framed by Potiphar's wife, and and also forgotten, even though he begged the butler to remember. A lot of humility here in Joseph, seeing that we don't see any anger at all, we don't see any you know revenge, anger at all. Verse 46, uh, Joseph was 36 years, or 30, excuse me, 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, this is, again, very similar to that of Yeshua, when it's commonly believed that Yeshua began his ministry at 30 years old. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the uh, laid up the food in the cities and laid up in every city the f- the food of the fields which sur- which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea, until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, quote, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house, unquote. So this is what Manasseh is indicating. And the name of the second was Ephraim, or Ephraim, Ephraim. Quote, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. 
Verse 53. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come. And as, as Joseph had said, the famine was in all lands, but all the land of Egypt, there, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. Reminds me. Reminds me of what Mary, in, in, according to the Gospel of John, what Mary said about Yeshua. Whatever he says to you, you do that. Verse 56. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt, so all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because of the famine was severe in all lands. Genesis 42, verse 1. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? He said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Joseph did not send Joseph's, excuse me, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with, uh, with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. See, he loved Benjamin very much. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain from those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and, and it was, it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. See, do you think that Yeshua recognizes his people, the Jews, but the Jews do not recognize him. The seed says, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, the seed. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. It's been a while, I think, since I've seen you. Hope everything is well. Verse 8, so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Verse 9, then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, oops, and said to them, you are spies. And you have come to see the nakedness of the land. In other words, the weakness, weaknesses that we have as a nation. And they said, no, my Lord, but, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you. And let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you. Or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Say, why would Joseph do this? I think he, did, he wasn't ready, or he, didn't, he, he felt like it wasn't time to reveal himself, so he had to play the part of this great man that is second in, you know, to Pharaoh, basically the most powerful man in the world besides Pharaoh in those days. And he also wanted to see his youngest brother, his, his only full-blooded brother. So he had to, he had to do this to get him to, get him to come to Egypt. Verse 18, then Joseph said to them, the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. 
if you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. And they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. See, Joseph was doing what he could to conceal his identity. Here's a question. Is Jesus concealing his identity? What do you guys think? Verse 24, And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and, and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain to restore every, man, every man's money to his, sack, to his sack and gave them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. So they loaded their donkeys with grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money, and there, there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, My money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that God has done to us? Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies out of the country. But when, he said, but when we said to him, We are honest men, we are not spies, we are twelve brothers, sons of, of, of our father, one is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man the Lord of the country said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your, bring your youngest brother to me. So I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you and you, shall, and you, and you may trade in the land. And then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And, Jacob's, and Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to, you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which, he, in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Genesis chapter 43. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt that their father said to them that their father said to them go back buy us a little food but Judah spoke to him saying the man solemnly warned us saying you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you if you send our brother with us we will go down and buy food but if you will not send him we will not go down for the man said to us you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you and Israel said why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother. But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, Could we possibly have known what he would say? That he would say, Bring your brother down? Then Judas said to Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and I will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. 
from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise, go back to the man. And may God Almighty give, your, give you mercy before the man that he may release you, your other brother and Benjamin. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. So the men took that present and Benjamin and, and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my home, slaughter an animal and make ready for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we, that we are brought in, so that he may make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when, when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. Is, uh, okay, hold on a second here. All right, so, so we have brought it back in our hand. And we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out, of, uh, out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave them, they gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon for they heard that they, they would eat the bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So they set him a, a place by himself and by them and them by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with, with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the, to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men looking in, in astonishment to one another, at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. Genesis 44. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. 
also put in put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks and with which he, intend, he, he indeed practices div divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouths of our sacks. How then could we s steal silver or gold from our Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we, will, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched and began with the oldest and left off with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? You see, now when they fell, when they fell, when they fell to the ground, there, there is the, there was the fulfillment. There was the fulfillment of the dream right there. The seed says, "Thanks for the warm welcome, Chris. I, I guess it was, it has been a while. I've been slacking off on studying these past few weeks." To be honest, I, I'm getting back on it. Well, good to see you back. Good to know you're getting back on it. Awesome. Genesis chapter 44, verse 16. Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in, who, in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak with a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a, a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he... If he leave his father, if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see, you shall see my face no more. So it was, when we went up to your father, your servant, my, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But, but we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go then we will go for we we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us then your servant my father said to us you know that my wife bore me two sons and the one went out uh, from me and said surely he has torn uh, surely he has torn to pieces and i have not seen him since but if you take this one also from me and calamity bef befalls him you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. 
Now, therefore, when I, ca- when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant, for your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let, my, let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? Genesis chapter 45, the revelation of Joseph. Verse 1, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out, out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God has sent me here, sent me before you to preserve life. In other words, to save. Verse 6, For these two years of famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was, it was not you who sent me here, but God. So Joseph, in the midst of all of the horrible things that happened to him, saw God in it all. As much as his brothers wanted to kill him, and figuratively did, and he was sold as a slave, and he was framed by Potiphar's wife, and he was forgotten by the, by the butler. In all of those horrible situations, God still did not get angry, or excuse me, Joseph still did not get angry. He was not offended because he saw God in all of it. And this is proof of it. He said to his brothers, it's not you that did this, it was God. You see the humility of Joseph. So this is a powerful, powerful key for us to walk in humility. To see Joseph, or excuse me, to see God in everything that happens in our lives. We are talking about this the other day. You know how some people get attacked by the devil. and Oh, the devil's attacking me. Well, look, look to God. Look to God. Okay? God is certainly on the throne. He certainly has the power. And no demon in hell can do anything except God gives them the ability to do it. And many times gives them the orders to do it. A.K.A. the, the evil spirit that was sent to Saul. The... Um, the devil that was sent to Job by God, okay, to name a few. You, you see God through all of it. You worship and you serve God, you trust Him, and this is part of humility. This is part of humility. So verse 8, again, Genesis 45, verse 8, so, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. So Joseph says, I was sent here to preserve life. I was sent here to save. Joseph the Savior. This is humility. You cannot 
walk in humility and also be easily offended at the same time. One of the keys of humility is, is, to, not, is to not hold a grudge, to forgive, forgiveness. To trust God. To see beyond the circumstances that you're in right now and to see God behind it all. To see God behind it all. This is, this is where it's all at. This is the humility of Joseph. He did not charge, he did not hold anything. He didn't have, he didn't have a grudge against Potiphar's wife. He didn't have a grudge against his brothers. He saved them all. He wept over them in, in great love and acceptance. He did not hold a grudge against the butler that forgot, that f forgot about him. Amazing, 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 amazing. So, we, we looked at Genesis chapter 3, the pride, and how pride came into the scene. So, then we looked at Genesis, a uh, story of Joseph, in those several chapters that we read. And we see what humility looks like. I want to take you to one more, actually another, I should say, uh, story of pride that turned into great humility. Now, this is one of the most powerful stories that I know of in the scriptures with regards to humility and, and how you can be blessed because of humility. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 5, the story of Naaman. If, if you guys don't know where I'm going with this, uh, this is noteworthy. Literally, uh, get ready to take notes. This is, this is just amazing. Absolutely amazing story of, of pride that, that turned into humility. Absolutely amazing. Do not forget this. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the, in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Okay, let's just digest that for a minute. Can you picture Naaman? I know it's Naaman in Hebrew, but I'll call, it Naaman, I'll call him Naaman as a conventional way of pronouncing it. Now just picture Naaman. He was like, he was a man of pride. Commander of the army of the king of Syria. Was a great and honorable man. Okay? And this, these kind of circumstances would definitely be conducive to pride. Great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because the Lord, by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. So this is somebody that God himself used. Naaman was a vessel of God, yet he was full of pride. So how can that happen? How can that be? Well, look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. You got people who God used powerfully, and yet they were rejected in the end. They were workers of iniquity. Even though God used them to speak through them, they prophesied, they cast out evil spirits, they, you know... And they performed many great things in the name of the Lord. And yet God rejected them. Yet Jesus rejected them at the end because of their iniquity. So just because God uses you doesn't mean you're right. Doesn't mean that you're... See, a lot of people, if there's a great man of God, there's a great preacher, evangelist, or whatever the case is, like, wow, this guy is just amazing. God uses him to do so, so much. Well, praise God. That's amazing. I love it. But don't think that that's a that that proves that he's where he should be because un 
God forbid, he could be in the group of Matthew 7, 21 to 23. The Anomians, those depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. Even though God used them. Even though God used them. So here was Naaman. It says here in verse 1, he was, a, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So he had a big problem. And a big problem. Verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out on raids and brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. So a young Jewish girl. Okay. Uh, she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were, were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Hmm. So this girl, this young girl, knew her stuff. Welcome, Vita. Blessings. Shabbat shalom to you. Hope all is well. How's things, how are things going today? This young girl knew her stuff. She knew there was, she knew there was a prophet of the Lord in the land of Israel. And not only that, but she knew that if Naaman would go to him, then this prophet would heal him of his leprosy. So here we got pride here, right? Naaman's got, Naaman is a man of pride. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is, who is from the land of Israel. Verse 5, Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. All right, so, so Naaman goes to the king, tells the king, okay, I hear from this servant girl that there's this prophet in Israel. Look at how I'm, 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 I got leprosy. I, it, this is my only hope. So the king is like, okay, go. Here, I'll send a letter of endorsement uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the king of Israel from the king of Syria, uh, you know, uh, and and. You know, just to support you and, and do whatever I can to be with you. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver. That's a lot. A talent is like 75 pounds. 10 talents of silver, that's a lot. 6,000 shekels of gold. Well, that's a lot. And 10 changes of clothing. So he expected to be there for a while. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying... Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. The king of Syria didn't say anything about the prophet, right? Yeah, he just, he just, he's like talking about, talking to the king as if it was all the king, the king's responsibility. Verse 7, it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me? To heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he speaks. He seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please, let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Some confidence there. There's some confidence there. Verse 9. Naaman went with his horses and chariot and took, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Okay, can you picture this? You got like the commander of the army of Syria, like one of the top, one of the, one of the most powerful men in all of Syria. With all of his entourage, with, with all of his men, and he goes to this humble abode of Elisha. And he's at the door of Elisha and he's and he is he's knocking. What did Elisha do? Did he did he come out and bow before Naaman and say, Greetings, my lord, greetings, my master. What can I do for you? You know, I'll do anything for you.
What did he do? Did he do that? No. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. In other words, I, I can just picture like Elisha in the house, maybe in a rocking chair, you know, just, oh, Naaman's here. Oh yeah, the great, the great man of mighty valor. And then all the entourage. Yeah, there's a, there's a traffic jam outside. Uh, I'm not even going to get up to the, go to the door. This man traveled a long ways to see me and... Uh, forget it. I'm not going to walk 20 feet. Uh, hey, hey, boy, come here. Come here. There. Come here, there, little messenger boy. Go to the door and go tell Naaman to go wash in the Jordan seven times and, and then he'll be clean. Then he'll be healed. You see where this is going? You see where this is going? Naaman, being a man of pride, would be inclined to be angry. Arrogance feeds anger. Those who are humble are not going to get angry very, very quickly at all. They're going to be able to take a lot without anger. Those who are proud, there's lots of, lots of pride and arrogance. Why? Why would that be? Because of the facade. Because pride produces unreasonable expectations. Pride pr produces expectations that if those expectations are not met, anger will come in. Anger will flare up. And that's exactly what happened in verse 11. Naaman became furious. And went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Like, man, this guy, this guy didn't even come out of the house. He didn't even open the door for me. He didn't even take a step for me. I, you know how far I've traveled? You know how much of a great man I am? You know how powerful I am? Mighty man of God, mighty man of valor here, standing here and you won't even answer the door? How dare you treat me with such disrespect? The expectation of, of Elisha coming out and praying and waving his hand over the place of leprosy and healing the leprosy. See, he had this expectation that was not met. That's pride. And then he got anger, angry because of it. That is all because of pride. Verse 12, are not Ab Abna and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? In other words, the rivers in our country, you know, again, pride sets in, right? Our rivers are a lot better than your rivers. And you're asking me to, to bathe in your river? Like what? That dirty old filthy place? We got beautiful rivers here. How dare you? Don't you know who it is standing at your door? You gonna tell me to bathe in that kind of thing? Give me a break. You gonna tell me to bathe in a pool of mud? <laughs> we got beautiful waters. If you want, if I need to just bathe to be clean, you send me to send me back to my country where it's better than your country. Better water. So he says, like, so this is verse 12. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. This is a sign of pride. This is a sign of pride. Vita over there on TikTok, I'll get you in, in a moment, Vita. Thank you for your patience. I appreciate that. Naaman. Naaman was a man of pride. And he was so angry, in a rage, because his expectations were not met, because he did not get what he expected. Anger and pride go hand in hand. Verse 13, And his, his servants came near and spoke to him, saying, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? In other words, even they see that he was a man that's full of pride. Like, okay, so if the prophet told you to, cl to climb Mount Everest ten times, 
would you not have done it? Because you're a man of pride, right? You like to, you like to brag about what you've done. You're a, man, you're a man of pride. So if the prophet were to tell you to go do some great thing, to do some great exploit, then you would have said, yay and amen to that for sure. I will. I'm, a, I'm, the, I'm the man for this. And after I do it, I can brag about it. So the servants noticed, knew what, this, what was going on. They got it before Naaman got it. So it's like, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? The answer would be yes, of course, because of his pride. Uh, how much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? In other words, this is easier, much easier for you, Naaman. Like, wake up. Get out of your arrogance, get out of your pride, and just go and humble yourself and go wash. Verse 14. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. Now, can you imagine? Just, just imagine. This was a very humbling thing for Naaman to do. He humbled himself. Very much. You think about it. It doesn't tell us exactly how bad he was, but he must have been pretty bad for him to go through all this and for him to go to these great lengths to, to find a cure. And he was a man of great reputation, commander of the, of the army of the king of, his, or the king of Syria, and great mighty man of valor, an honorable man, a man that a lot of people looked up to and respected, honored, Can you imagine what must have happened? He had to take his clothes off. I can just imagine being there and hearing people go, oh, I didn't know he was that bad. Look how ugly that is. Wow. Look how much, look how diseased he is. It was, it would have been very humiliating for him. It would have been very humiliating for him to do what he did. He would have had, he would have had to literally disrobed. And that in and of itself would be, it would be humiliating, let alone with all this leprosy all over him. Uh, so this is like the ultimate humility right here. And what happened? You know what happened. God loves humility. God loves obedience. So what did God do? It says, his flesh, the flesh of Naaman was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. A great, mighty miracle happened. A mighty miracle happened. Amazing. And of course, in the very next verse, he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. There is a story of, 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 of humility. So we went from Genesis chapter 3, the story of pride. We have the story of Joseph, the story of humility, and the story of Naaman, the story of pride to humility. Here's another one. This is amazing stuff, folks. This is amazing. Now, let's go to the story of Nebuchadnezzar. This is one of the reasons why I believe that When it comes to mental illness, unfortunately, I think that the very root of it in many, I'm not saying all, but I think the very root of it is a lack of humility because pride sets a person up in a place where it's very fragile. You're fragile mentally, you're fragile emotionally, You're fragile psychologically. You're just, you're just a fragile person with pride. Humility brings you down and 
places you run on the rock. Okay, this is an amazing story. Another amazing story of from pride to humility. We got Nebuchadnezzar. So we had Naaman, Nebuchadnezzar. Again, for those of you who are, if you're not familiar with this, if you don't already have this, make sure you take notes. This is just amazing stuff. Oh, by the way, Vida. Let's see what we have here. Vida. Vita says, thank you, sir. I was in synagogue and asked the rabbi about the way people attack me when I was when I finished Torah. And he said, it was because is because your soul come closer to Hashem and your body will be attacked by the world. I, I, I don't believe that's a good I don't believe that's a good answer. I don't believe that's a good answer to it. Uh, I wouldn't I definitely wouldn't say that. Um, and I would say that because of this. I mentioned this last night. Um, when your soul comes close to God, God will protect you. And you, you said it yourself, Vita, in the, in the chat the other night, that one of the promises of God is, is the protection. You know, God protects those. Uh... So generally speaking, I would say that that is not true, uh, Vita. That's not true. You look at how these mighty men of God throughout the scriptures, you know, how, how well they were blessed and, and how they were uh, protected in many ways. Yeah, you know, it says in the Torah to obey the Torah, and when you obey the Torah, all will go well with you, and you will live long in the, in the land the Lord, the Lord God has given you. Give, give me a couple minutes, guys. Just give me a couple minutes.
Thank you for your patience, guys. Appreciate that. Okay, let's start with Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. This is, uh, this is a, an am another amazing story giving us, um, giving us a very good uh, rundown of, of the difference, again, between pride and humility and how someone can go from pr uh, being proud to humble themselves. Thomas says, good stuff, giving me some ideas of study. Thank you, Thomas, appreciate that. Flo says, this is an excellent teaching. Well said, thank you, Flo, appreciate that. All right, another amazing story. If you thought that Naaman was a good one, this is also a good one as well. Daniel, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwelt in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High has worked for me. Okay, so right off the bat here, this is this is actually the words of Nebuchadnezzar right here. Nebuchadnezzar is actually writing this. And this is amazing. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my, on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Again, here we have again, God speaking through dreams. Isn't this amazing? You got Joseph, and now we have Nebuchadnezzar, God speaking through dreams. Verse 6, therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told, him, I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the, holy spirit, or that the spirit of the holy God is in you. Again, this would, be, this would be the Holy Spirit, by the way. Talk about that. We'll be starting our Holy Spirit series tomorrow. I know that the, holy, that the spirit of the holy God is in you. So once again... We had it before with Joseph, and now here again with, with Daniel. I reiterate this, and that is that the Holy Spirit filled people before Acts chapter 2. The only difference in Acts chapter 2 is it was for all flesh as opposed to just, you know, a few here and there, or just the Jewish people, or just the prophets and these kind of things. I know the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. And its interpretation. Verse 10. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of, the, of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. So this watcher is a, an angel, okay? 
we read in the book of Hebrews that there, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the great cloud of witnesses. So what, who, what's this great cloud of witnesses? The angels, the spirits of just men made perfect, those in the heaven, in the spiritual realm. Yeah, there are spirits that are in, in, um, enjoined to be witnesses on earth. You know, we read about it in the prophets, you know, I bring heaven and earth to witness against you, you know? Heaven and earth can be witnesses of, uh, heaven and earth is witnesses. They are witnesses. What does it mean heaven be, what does it mean for heaven to be a witness? I understand that to mean like the angels of heaven are there to be witnesses. See, God operates just like how a court of law here on earth would operate. He has certain laws. He has certain ways. Even in the Torah, it talks about, you know, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. So even God himself, by his own law, needs to have witnesses. And so we have the witnesses, which are the watchers. Watcher slash witness, same thing. The book of Enoch is, says a lot about the watchers, the, uh, the angels, the angels of heaven. So there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven, says Nebuchadnezzar, verse 14. He cried aloud and said, chop down the tree and cut off his branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven let, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a, of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, an animal. And let seven times pass over him. In other words, seven years. You know, a lot of people today, right? They're more like animals than they are humans. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? I think that this is one of the reasons why. Because they had the Nebuchadnezzar syndrome. Verse 17. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, the angels themselves, that would be. And the sentence by the word of the holy ones. Those are the angels. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. In other words, you know, regardless of all the crazy politics that may be going on, at, at, at the end of the day, so to speak, the Most High is the one who rules. He rules all the earth. He rules all the kingdoms. He gives each one, each kingdom per se, to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. Key there, the lowest of men. Verse 18, see, pride will bring you down. You know, a lot of rulers, political rulers and world rulers that have pride, they're going to come down. A lot of them have already come down. I mean, look at throughout history. So many have fallen because of this. Verse 18, this dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, that would be Daniel, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. So again, very much like Joseph and Pharaoh and this kind of thing. Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar, Daniel, answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, again, this is figuratively speaking, by the way, and, on, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the, the animals of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens. Again, this is obviously figures of speech, reaches to the heavens. Again, 
please guys do yourself a favor when you're reading the scriptures do not take it literally many times it is very figurative or metaphoric symbolic don't always take it hyper literally okay especially when we have things that just doesn't match up with with our god-given senses and science i do believe that god is the god of science he has created the the laws of nature and the laws of physics the laws of mathematics it's all based upon god's creation and what in what he did now i know i know i know we have a lot of scientists that have a lot of different biases and their biases shine through in their works i get it but i'm just, i'm just saying science in and of itself in its raw form is simply just the observation measurement computation interpretation of nature of God's creation. That's what it is. So your greatness says Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. Verse 23. And in as much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your, Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, And they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over you. Till you know. Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And gives it to to whomever he chooses. So notice. Here it is again. Reiterated. So. The interpretation of the dream is that Daniel will become like an animal and that he will, be like, he will be like an animal for seven years until he acknowledges that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. So that's very much like what we read here earlier in verse 17 that the most high rules in the in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he will and sets it over the sets over it the lowest of men little hint in there verse 26 and inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules therefore o king let my advice be acceptable to you break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps, look at that. There's no like presumption there. Keep in mind, pride is the, pride is the mother of presumption. Presumption. People who have pride, even in the church, even church rulers, even evangelists, preachers, pastors, priests, whatever, a lot of these people, unfortunately, have a lot of presumption. A lot of presumption. Oh, you said the sinner's prayer. You're saved. You're saved. Really? Well, there's no repentance. Oh, but you're saved. Presumption. Oh, you're sick. Well, all you got to do is just declare that God is your healer and that by his stripes you are healed. Just go and confess that. A lot of presumption. A lot of presumption here. Here, there's no presumption. And we see this in the book of Acts too, by the way. It's like, well, maybe God might forgive you <laughs> if you do that. No presumption there. No, like, yeah, I claim, you know, the, I claim it. No, uh, perhaps there may be a lengthening of your pros- prosperity. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Now look at this. Look at this saying. 
But look at this for a moment. Is not this great Babylon? This is pride. This is pride right here. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by, by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? You see the pride in there? That's like stinks, as my grandmother would say, stinks to high heaven. That is, that's raunchy with, with pride. That is rotten with arrogance and pride. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? It says here in verse 31, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. <laughs> wow. Just like that. Just like that. Pride comes before destruction, as it says in the scriptures, in the holy scriptures. Pride comes before destruction. Verse 32. And they shall drive you from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts, with the animals of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times, seven years shall pass over you until you know, again, this is the third time, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. In other words, like, this is like re redundant, right? It's over and over again. This is done until you know the most high rules. You got to know the most high rules. It's not you. Until you know the most high rules. And gives it to whomever he chooses. It's not by your aptitude. It's not by your power or strength or might. It's all by God. It's by grace. Daniel chapter 4, verse 33, the very next verse says, That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, and his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, so this would be like after seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven. There is a little bit of a ray of light of, this is, the, this is humility now. Humility is starting to sink in. When he looks, lifts up his eyes to heaven, like, look, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not, the, you're not the, on the top of the world, okay? There's, some, there's something above you. There's someone above you. You're not on top of everything. You're not the strongest. You're not the mightiest. It's not because of you. It's not because of your works. Someone else is in charge. Lifted up his eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His and his, excuse me, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor return to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and ways are justice and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. That's amazing.
So Nebuchadnezzar was a man of great pride. When he finally humbled himself, he came back to his he he came back to his senses. He came to his he he, he came back to his right mind. So he humbled himself and God healed him of this you could say mental illness that he had. Now, I'm not going to read the entire book of Job, but the entire book of Job is about humility, pride. I didn't see it. I didn't know it until... See, I read through the book of... I read the book of Job. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many times. It wasn't until I listened to the audiobook version of the book of Job from beginning to end in one sitting without any distractions I literally just sat down and listened to the entire book and it was like a movie playing out in front of me then I saw what was going on then I understood it way better than I ever understood it before you know if you haven't listened to the to the or read through the God, the um, the book of Job from beginning to end in one sitting then I highly recommend you do to make a long story short, this is what I see in the book of Job. We got Job, it says in the very beginning. Let's just go there. Job chapter 1. Actually, guys, I'm sorry to do this again. Can I give me about three or four minutes? I'll be right back.
Thanks again for your patience. Appreciate that. Job, an amazing story about a man who was, well, he had an issue of pride, I do believe. And the whole book of Job is about how he went from a man that had this issue of pride in his, in his character to a man who was very humble. So I'm not going to read through uh, all of it, but just quickly glance over this. Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, okay, that, whose name was Job. He was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So he had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned all of this, uh, lots of livestock and such. His son, sons used to hold feasts in their homes on, on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Okay, when, a, when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. See, so why would that be? Why would Job have to purify them? Early in the morning, he, uh, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, saying, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Well, this is, again, um, this is not a, you know, a very good situation if you say, well, maybe my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. Uh, so it says here that there were times, just like how it talks about in the story of Micaiah, that there are angels, spirits that come, pre present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came with them. And the Lord basically sent Satan to afflict Job. I'm not going to read this whole thing. But that's basically what happened. It was God's idea. It was not Satan's idea. It was God's idea. So Satan went off to afflict Job, to attack Job. Why did Satan attack Job? Not because he was close to God, like some people think, you know. You get attacked because you're close to God or you're close to Jesus and this kind of thing. No, no. Uh, in fact, you know, generally speaking, you're promised, uh, you're promised protection by God. But why is it that God sent Satan to Job? I believe it's quite clear that there was this issue of pride in Job's heart that gave Satan legal right to afflict him. We know this because throughout the book of Job, Job blamed God for what happened. He said that he, Job claimed to be more righteous than God. That's pride. That's big time pride. Job claimed to know, to be more righteous than God, to know, you know, I do more right than God does. Basically, that's what Job said. Now, skipping forward to Job chapter 42, the last, actually, no, before that, we got Elihu, Elihu, uh, that came into the, into the scene at the very end, just before God himself spoke to Job. And Elihu really did a wonderful job at humbling Job. Like, who do you think you are? Look at, look at the great, you know, creatures that God created and look at all the powerful things of, of creation. Look at all the wonders of creation and the great and mighty things that you don't understand. Job, and you think you know more than God? You think that you're more righteous than God? Like, so he really did a very good job humbling Job. And then God stepped in himself. It reminds me of uh, way back in the day when I was just, just, just got born again. True story. I'll tell you a true story. I was, uh, I was in the back seat with a, with a friend of mine, um, another guy that I did some ministry with. And we were traveling from one city to another city. So we had, we were in the back seat. So we had about an hour to spare. So I pulled out the book of Job in the back seat and I started reading from Elihu forward. From Elihu forward, whether it be 
chapter 34, I believe it would be. Chapter 34. I started reading from, from Elihu forward, and it was just an amazing time because it was just so powerful. It was so humbling for me to read it and for, the other, for my friend to actually be there. He felt very humbled as well, just really feeling you know, the presence of God in the car. and It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Humility brings that as well. Humility brings the presence of God. So yeah, in context, uh, I'm not going to read the entirety of what Elihu says. That's, a, that's, that's quite a bit. But Elihu humbles Job. Who do you think you are, Job? How can you say what you said? And then the Lord spoke up, and the Lord, you know, basically did it, you know, polished off what Elihu started. Um. God himself speaking. Job chapter 40, verse 1. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Because you see, Job Job thought that he was better than God. Man, he was like, hey, I'm going to correct God. Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I, I'm unworthy. So Job was starting to get humbled here. How can I reply to you? I put my hand, I put my hand over my mouth. Like I've, I, I spoke once, but I have no answer twice, but I, I will say no more. And the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. See, sometimes God speaks out of the storm and sometimes God speaks out of the stillness. Remember the story of Elijah? Still small voice. Sometimes from the storm, sometimes from the stillness. You, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, Brace yourself. This is what God says to Job. Brace yourself like a man and I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? You have an arm like God's and would you have power like God? Can you can your voice thunder like his? You know, so God goes on a, just a an amazing discourse with Job humbling him which he needed desperately. See, God used, God called Satan to afflict him so that, so that Job would be humbled. I know that goes against a lot of people's theology, but I do believe that's the truth. I do believe that's the truth. Job chapter 42, we'll skip on to the end. And you'll see here, this is where, this is the final repentance of Job. This is where, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. This was where Job, this was the, the tipping point where Job completely repented and humbled himself before God. Job 42, verse 1, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. See that? That's, that's pride. Things too wonderful for me to know. See, that's pride. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears, here it is right here. Here it is right here. This is Job 42, verse 5. My ears had heard of you. In other words, I have head knowledge about you. <laughs> Amen. I have had knowledge about you. I've heard of you. I know about you. I know God up here. I heard about you. I heard of you. Now here's the key. But now my eyes have seen you. This is like the born again experience of Job. It's so important us to have personal experience with God because without that we could be like Job it's so important for us to have a personal experience with God not just knowledge in it up here 
nothing wrong with knowledge up here. I think God wants us to have knowledge up here, okay? He wants us to have head knowledge. He wants us to use our noggin. God gave us a noggin, okay? He wants us to use it. He wants us to have the knowledge. He wants us to know and mem remember all these things, to know the scriptures. I mean, even Jesus himself said over and over again, have you not read? Don't you understand? Have you not read? Have you? Don't you know? Don't you understand? I, have you not? I, haven't you studied this stuff? So he wants us to study, of course. But it's, it's really all about experiential knowledge. You can read, I used to say this, um, I used to say this before Queen Elizabeth passed away. I used to say, you know, you can go to the library, you can read all the books about Queen Elizabeth that you can find. You can have all kinds of head knowledge, but you can't go to Buckingham Palace and, and visit her. You're not going to get it. You're not going to go there. It's one thing to have all the head knowledge. It's another thing if she walks in your door. Same thing with God. It's one thing to have head knowledge. And that's, that's awesome. That's, that's powerful. That's, I mean, there's so many Christians that need it. But they also need to see God talk about this this is another just another I, I, I didn't even think about this until now this is the first time I thought about this this is yet another piece of evidence against the gospel of John where God says or where, where John says no one has ever seen God at any time <laughs> where were you <laughs> uh, Jacob saw God face to face he even called the, the name of the place Peniel face of God Moses spoke to God face to face very clear about, the, about that. Here, Job, now my eyes have seen you. <laughs> I mean, we, we can go on. I'm sure we can find other p parts of Scripture where people have... Actually, it's like... We can pull out a number of, of things. This is like, Yeah. Um, don't want to go too much on a rabbit trail there, but this is the key. We need head knowledge. Yes. We need to hear about God. We need to hear the truth. All that kind of stuff. But we also need to see for ourselves. We also need to have that experiential knowledge. We also have to, we need to be able to say, like Job said, now my eyes have seen you. Now my eyes have seen you. So this is where he, this was the final, the last moments of his pride died off. His pride, the last moments when, when his pride died, the pride of Job expired at that moment. That's why it says you cannot see God and live. You cannot see God and live to self, live for self. You, that, that's, when, that's when you, that's when all, all things are passed away and all things become new. The J, Jacob becomes Israel. Abram becomes Abraham. That's when Saul became as a new man, it says, when the Spirit of God came upon him. A couple more things, actually. There's quite a bit, actually, when it comes to... Uh, Quickly going over some of the verses. I'm going to, I'm going to go through a few verses quickly uh, uh, from the Psalms and Proverbs. And then let's go to the temptation of Christ. Then from there, let's go into the, uh, the Gospels and see how people have been blessed through humility as well as the Epistle of James as well. That's all on the, that's all on the uh, schedule here. Quickly, we're just going to shoot through these. Uh, Psalm 10, 4. In his pride, wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. That's what pride does. Let their lying lips be silenced, for with pride and contempt they speak arrogantly against the righteous. That's what proud people do. They speak arrogantly against the righteous. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob. 
Okay, so this would be the pride of God. I, well, actually, you could say that this is well, the pride of Jacob, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. And this is really the only thing you can actually say, as it, as it says in the scriptures, the only thing you can really boast about is knowing God. The only thing that you can really boast about is, is knowing God. Actually, in other Bible translations, that was the NIV. The other Bible translations do not use the word pride there. So that would be the that would be the uh, decision of the translators of the NIV. Psalm 59, this is one of the prayers. Uh, for, for the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride for cursing and lying w which they speak. Psalm 73, verse 6, for pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate all to hate evil, Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. The fear, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Okay, the problem with most people in America today and in the West is we don't have much of the fear of God anymore, do we? We don't have the fear of God. We have all the teachings about the love of God, but where's the fear of God? It's a famine of the fear of God in the, in the land. Proverbs 11.2 When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 13 verse 10 Only by pride comes contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Proverbs 14 verse 3 In the mouth of the foolish is the rod of pride. But the lips of the wise shall preserve them. And once again, in, in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, verse 23, a, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Perfect. Isn't that amazing? Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. That's why God chose Moses. God wants to humble us. Verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And you shall remember the Lord your God you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. 
Verse 16, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do, uh, to do you good in the, in the end. Psalm 2, or, sorry, excuse me, Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 28, you will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. And the very famous verse, a lot of people's favorite, Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Psalm 9, 12, when he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Psalm 10, verse 12, arise, Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Psalm 10, verse 17, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. Psalm 18, 27, you will save the humble people but will bring down haughty looks, proud looks, this pride. Psalm 25, verse 9, the humble he guides, as God guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. Psalm 30, 34, verse 2, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear of it and be glad. Psalm 69, verse 32, the humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. Psalm 147, verse 6, the Lord lifts up the humble and cast down the wicked to the ground. And there's this juxtaposition between the humble and the wicked. It's either you're humble or you're wicked. Psalm 149, verse 4, and the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Proverbs 3, 34, surely he scorns the scornful. This is Pratt, the pride, actually in the Greek, uh, it's translated as pride. Surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 6, verse 3. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself, for you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 16, 19. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Proverbs 29, verse 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Isaiah 29, 19, the humble shall also increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. I love this. This is amazing. Isaiah 57, verse 15, for, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Think about this for a moment. This is so powerful, so amazing. What's God saying here? I, it's like I live in the highest place, but also with the lowest. Um, I, I live in the highest place, but also in the lowest place. I, I live in the highest of heavens, but also with the, those who are in the lowest place. Figuratively speaking, humility. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. It's like, how do you meet God? You can't meet him in the highest place. You can't meet him in the highest place. You meet him in the lowest place. And how do you do that? By humbling yourself. Bite the bullet. Humble yourself.
Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 26, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown. Nothing shall remain the same. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Daniel chapter 10, after the prayer of Daniel chapter 9. See, Daniel prayed for three weeks, prayed and fasted. And then the answer came, do not fear, Daniel, for the fir from, from the first day you set your heart to understand and, and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come be because of your words. You want your words to be heard before God? Humble yourself. Zephaniah 3.11, in that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Tower Time says Shabbat Shalom and howdy brothers and sisters. Bless y'all. Shabbat Shalom the Tower Time. Welcome. Blessings. Blessings multiplied back to you. David says Shabbat Shalom fam. What a beautiful Shabbat day it is. May our Yah bless us and keep us all. Thank you very much. David, Shabbat Shalom. May Yah bless you even more. Good to see you. I want to skip ahead into the Gospels. Matthew chapter 4. The Temptation of of Christ. We read before the um, the Trinity of sin, as I call it, in First John chapter two, and I do believe that that is also found here as well as in Genesis chapter three. So, Matthew chapter four. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Sometimes the Spirit can lead you into the wilderness, you know. Verse 2, and when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. All right, so this is the fasting. This is, hum this is humility as well. When you fast, you're humbling yourself. 
you know, and you have to fast in the right way, as it says in Isaiah chapter 58, and also as it's um, enumerated in, uh, expounded upon in the Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, you can just go through the, the motions of fasting without really having it like a true, honest fast, meaning that you truly humble yourself and help and serve others. You know, take the resources that you would have consumed that you would have consumed and and give it to others. This is this is the greatest fast. The greatest fast is when you take the resources that you would normally use for yourself and give it away to someone somebody else. Like for example, there there are many different ways to do this, many different ways to do this. For example, let's say you fast a meal. Count the cost of the meal. And then Take that money that you saved and give it to the poor. Count the cost of, or take the money, or take the food that you would have eaten, fast the food and give it, give it to the hungry. You know, this kind of stuff. There are many different ways to do this. Fasting is definitely a good way to humble yourself. Verse three. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. So this is the lust of the flesh again. This is the lust of the flesh. Just like how it says in Genesis chapter 3 that Eve saw the fruit of the tree was good for food. A lot of people think of the lust of the flesh as being something else, but really in many places in the, in the scriptures, we got like food being part of the lust of the flesh. Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, of course, as Jesus was the rabbi that he was, he would use the Torah against the devil, for sure. Verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay, so here, here is the pride of life. Let's, let's unpack this. So the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. So there's, there's a little bit of a clue right there. Up on the very top. The high place, if you will. The pinnacle of the temple. This is all speaking of pride. And he said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give, he shall give His angels charge over you. That's presumption. This is what we were talking about all the time. When it comes to the things of God and the things about the Bible and all that kind of stuff, the pride is usually pride that's quote-unquote based in the Bible. Like, it is written, he shall, give his, he shall give his angels charge over you. So that, therefore, just presume that you have this and just do it. Just throw yourself down. So this is pride. This is just outright presumption. It just baffles me how much I have seen this kind of stuff in the church today. The churches today are littered. Actually, more than that saturated, buried in pride, presumption, arrogance, hypocrisy. Oh, love, 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 love. Yeah, you know what? Those are the kind of people who will hate on you the most. They're the ones that, who, they're the, they're the ones that will turn on you. They're the ones that will ignore you, unfriend you, disrespect you. These hypocrites. This is pride here. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. In other words, just take it upon yourself. Presume that you have the, you know. No, don't. Even if someone's quote scripture over you like that. Don't. Stay humble. Just stay humble. Don't assume or presume. Don't, you, don't assume that you think you know what it means and how to interpret it. Don't presume don't pick a piece of the, the, the verse here or verse there. And like I always say, don't 
don't just like cherry pick verses like this when you don't see it as a common thread throughout the rest of Scripture. So the devil, he quoted two different scriptures at Jesus at that, at that point in time. He shall give his angels charge you over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So in other words, again, it's, it's the presumption. Presumption. This is where it's all at when it comes to pride. Spiritual pride. It's so much presumption. Here is another story. Luke chapter 14, parable, a parable of pride versus humility. By the way, Sean, Shabbat Shalom, good to see you. Blessings, blessings. Sean says, Christopher, I've been, I've been listening in the background. Powerful message, message today. Very much needed this message. Blessings. Thank you very much, Sean. Blessings, blessings multiplied to you. Luke chapter 14, verse 7. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited... Go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, uh, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now remember, we, read, we, read, we just read this in Ezekiel. So this is not like Yeshua just didn't make this up. What he's doing is he's, he's unpacking the Torah. And he's teaching on it. He's unpacking the Tanakh and teaching on it. Another thing. In the Gospels, Matthew chapter 5. I'll start with verse 1. The beginning of the, quote-unquote, the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 it says here, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, he being Jesus, went up on a mountain, and when he, seated, when he was seated with his disciples, or his disciples came to him, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, First and foremost, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is talking about humility. This is talking about humility. Being poor in spirit is being humble. Being rich in spirit is being proud. Keep in mind as well that there are at least two different Greek words that are used that are both translated as poor throughout the New Testament. One of those Greek words means poor. You're poor, but yet you're able to, you're able to sustain yourself. You're able to get back up on your feet. And the other word means poor and not able. Like really, really poor. Like you're poor and you're not able to help yourself at all. You have to rely entirely upon an ex, some, like some, somebody outside of yourself to sustain your life. You know, this is what Yeshua, was, I, I believe this is what Yeshua meant when he said you must become like a little child. To see the kingdom of heaven? I think he was teaching not only the sinlessness, again, uh, you know, the Torah, I believe the Torah, the Tanakh is very clear that this whole original sin thing is total nonsense, but he wants us to become sinless like a child is sinless. Never transgresses the Torah, therefore never sins, therefore does not have sin. Simple, simple logic. Because sin is is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. So, I think he, I think when he, when he taught that, it was, it was so rich. It's such a rich teaching. You must become like the smallest of children, 
like newborn babes, basically. Those who are pure and innocent, sinless. They never transgress Torah. They never do. Those who are poor in spirit, they're not they're not poor. They're not, they're not poor as in the other word that's used in the Greek that they're poor, but yet they're able to get what they need. No, they're poor, but they're not able to get what they need. They're really poor. It's that very same word that Jesus uses here in Matthew 5, 3. The Greek word used here is the word that means poor and completely disabled basically you cannot you cannot sustain yourself you're not able to help yourself at all that's the word that's used here that's the word that's used here poor and not able To sustain yourself. This is being humble. This is humility. Poor in spirit. It's the first thing in the Beatitudes. It's the first thing in the Sermon on the Mount. First thing he says. I, I, I believe every church tomorrow morning should be preaching humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit should be the first thing you see when you walk in the church. Blessed are those who are humble. Because we got so much, so many churches that are just littered with arrogant, proud people, and unfortunately, even in the pulpit. Now, later on in the Beatitudes, in verse. Actually, the whole thing, the whole thing is all about, it's all about humility. Everything is all about humility here. Like verse four, the next, the very next verse, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. That's, that's, that's being humble. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. That word is translated as humble in many of the other Bible translations. See, go over here to Blue Letter Bible, Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek. And you check out the different Bible translations, you'll see, the NLT puts in, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. The CSB, blessed, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. NASB, blessed are the gentle, or humble, or meek, for they shall inherit the earth. LSB, blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is also a sign of humility. If you really are humble and you humble yourself under God, you are hungry and thirsty for Him. You're hungry and thirsty for righteousness. See, proud people think they got it all. A lot of these people, they, they are, they're born in the church, they're raised in the church, more or less, and, and they think that they're all good with God because, oh, I go to church. And then, you know, when something comes around like like what happened there four years ago and the churches are shut down, oh, no, I can't go to church. I feel like I'm not close to God. Well, what 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 is your God? The church? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. That is humility. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful. Again, you can't be merciful without being humble. See, one of the things of, we read about in the book of uh, the Sefer Hayashar, the book of Jasher, is that the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were cities that were not very merciful to others. Now we know that you know there were other sins that very much marked their behaviors sexual immorality but 
The point is this, with the humble, if you're humble, you will be merciful. You're not going to mistreat those who are in need. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This again is all about humility. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're not persecuted for righteousness' sake, you better reassess. Preach, preach righteousness. Live righteousness. Preach it. I think you'll find what I have found, and that is the people that go to church, not all of them, but most of them, people who go to church, they... They're the they're the ones that oppose you. They should not. They should be the they should be the ones that are supporting you. Preacher of righteousness should be supported by everybody who calls themselves a Christian, every member of every church, because churches are by definition people who are called out from the world. The word church in the Greek ekklesia means simply those who are called out, those who are separated, set apart, those who are holy. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all manner of all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I'm very convinced that if the prophets of old, the great prophets of God were to come back from the dead if they could. Even Jesus himself were to come back to earth and and go to the church. He'd be kicked out. He'd be kicked out. Say, why is that? According to John 7, 7, and I know I'm here I'm quoting John, but I do believe that this is in, in accordance with the Torah, with the Tanakh. Jesus said that the world hates him. Why does the world hate him? He, he said exactly why. He said, because... I testify that their deeds are evil. I think he would walk into many churches today and testify that their deeds are evil. Another story of humility versus pride. Matthew chapter 7. Love this. This is just before, actually. This is just, this is a story just before one of my favorite passages in Matthew. This is Matthew 7, 21 to 23. But I'm not going there at this point. Uh, Matthew 7, 24. Oh, excuse me, not Matthew. Mark, Mark, excuse me. It's Mark chapter 7, verse 24. There, for the, from there he arose, this would be Jesus, and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it. Again, this is Mark for you. He, Jesus doesn't want anybody to know where he is or who he is or anything like that. He wants to go under the radar all the time here. But he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So what was Jesus saying there what did he mean what was that all about well you see in the day in the culture and we know this uh, 
because we we have illusions of this throughout the Tanakh, but we also have the Book of Enoch that uh, that also brings this concept out, and that is that different nationalities are represented by different animals. The children of Israel are represented by sheep. There's no like Jesus didn't just make it up. Okay, this is stuff that was that existed in scripture before Jesus ever spoke of sheep, his sheep or whatever, you know, I come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, this kind of stuff. Jesus did not make that stuff up. He was talking the, the vernacular of the day. So here was not a Jew. This woman was not a, 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 this woman was not a child of Israel. This woman therefore was not a sheep. Jesus made it clear that he came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, in his eyes, and according to the culture, she was a dog. As he said, let the little children be, fir- let the children be filled first. What's this talking about? This talks about the children of the kingdom, i.e. the children of Israel. The, the, the Jewish people. For it is not good to take the children's bread. In other words, the blessings... And the time, basically, the time and blessings uh, that was meant to be given to the children of Israel and throw it to the little dogs, i.e. this woman. Now, this woman, fortunately, was a very humble woman. She was very humble. If she wasn't humble, she would be offended right there. Testing, one, two, testing. Okay, I think we got it again. Sorry, guys. I'm, I've been trying to work on the problem. I know we've, we've been having an audio issue here, uh, issue here for the past few weeks. And I'm doing all kinds of different things to try to figure out what the problem is. And I, and I just I can't get it yet. I'm not sure what the, what the issue is here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Randy, for letting me know. Say no audio and good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, so this woman was a very humble woman, or else she would have been offended right right there. She would have stormed away in this fit of anger, in this rage, but she didn't. She was very humble. She was denied the miracle that she was looking. That's number one. She could have been, like, like Naaman, she could have been offended just because of that. She was denied that, at least initially, and then she was called a dog. Oh, sorry, guys. All right. Uh, so it says here, she answered him and said, yes, Lord. Say, yes, Lord. So she's not fighting him at all. She's not offended at all. No offense at all. It, it, she was very humble. Like, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Wow, what an awesome and wise thing to say. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and, the, and her daughter lying on the bed. You look at uh, other synoptic, uh, the, the other synoptic um, gospels, you'll find different differences in the story. Like th- there is a time uh, in the other gospel, it says that the disciples were saying, get rid of her, you know, get rid of her, you don't, you know. So she was, uh, if that's true, assuming that's historic, uh, she was, she had to go through a lot. She had to go through rejection upon rejection upon being called a dog until finally she got her miracle because of her, persi- but not just because of her persistence. It wasn't so much her persistence. It was her humility. Her humility did it all. There's a thing called being intellectually humble. 
and I think this is very important for us in our studies, it's it's the ability to to acknowledge first of all to yourself and then to others that you know we don't know everything uh, maybe there's something that i don't know that may change my mind you're willing to listen you're willing to hear of, of anything that maybe goes against what you what you think what you believe being willing to change even if it hurts So there is an amazing story as well of humility. James chapter 4, pride promotes strife, verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet, covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the scripture who dwell, excuse me, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, and gives grace to the humble. That's an amazing portion. I'll tell you a true story. Years ago, I was working with this, this gentleman, and this, other, this gentleman was a believer too. And he said to me, he said, you know where it says, you know, that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble? I said, yeah. He said, do you know what the word resists really means? I said, well, tell me, what does it mean? I, what does it really mean? He said, you know, in the Greek, it denotes a, uh, God setting, it, setting himself up in battle array against you. It's not just resisting, but it's actually making war against like it's a very emphatic and extreme way of, of resisting, like actual war, setting himself up in battle array. So I actually, you know, after he said that to me, uh, after a while I did, I looked it up in the Greek as well, and that's exactly what it says. That's, that's exactly what it means. So when it says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, It means God sets himself up in battle array against the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Notice, it doesn't say he gives grace to the proud. It doesn't say he resists the humble. It says he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Everybody claims the grace of God, right? Everybody claims the grace of God. But we must be humble in order to receive grace, according to this scripture. There's another one I'd like to point out. Another one that I'd like to point out here. 
Regina says, Shabbat Shalom, my husband invited me here. Well, welcome, welcome. Shabbat Shalom, welcome and blessings multiplied to you and your husband, your family. Subscribed, bells clicked. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. Welcome aboard. Says, you are definitely the clear example of an intellectual hello. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, unsub now from another YouTube teacher who knows it all. <laughs> well, yeah, if you find somebody who knows, you know, they know it all, definitely... Uh, you don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, subscribed to them. But welcome, Regina. Good to see you. Blessing, blessing. Okay. One Peter five five. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. That is amazing. I have just another thing I would like to bring to you guys' attention just before we wrap this up. Those of you who have any questions, comments, feel free to drop those in the live chat, especially in regards to this topic that we are, that we are um, talking about today. I know earlier, uh, was it Soldier of Yahweh asked about Deuteronomy 30. Yeah, Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Soldier of Yahweh, we're going to have to take a rain check on that. All right, we talk about Deuteronomy 30 quite often, and uh, so we'll do that again. Remind me, please. Thank you. Okay, so we were talking about pride. You know, pride has got presumption unreasonable expectations, produces anger. Uh, people who are very, very easily angered uh, more than likely has an issue of pride. People who are not willing to listen more than likely has an issue of pride. You know, humble people will listen. Humble people will listen. That's one of the it's one of the uh, attributes of humility. The, the ability and the power to listen. So powerful. So I mentioned this earlier. There are a lot of people in the church today, and I've been there, done that myself, okay? I, I've, I've been there, done that. Where it's like a lot of presumption. A lot of presumption, you know? Like some people in, the, in some of the charismatic world, they would say, if they get sick, it's like, just claim that you're healed, even though you're sick. Just say, no, that's not right. I'm, I'm healed. By his stripes, I'm healed. But let's not presume. Let's, you know, because I know people. I, I have known people that have caused a lot of harm uh, because they presume that they're healed. And there's this one, another true story. There's this one time I was at this, um, this worship prayer meeting and there was this, there was this man who came in and he was sick and he was sick. He was very sick. And, and he got me sick. I was, I was so sick. I got infection in my lungs. I had to have this antibiotics that, and, and I actually told him, I said, you know, please, uh, next time, if you're very sick, just stay away. He's like, well, but by his stripes, I'm healed. I, I came, you know, claiming that. By his stripes, I'm healed. Oh, but you know what? Like, 
there's it's one thing to presume it's another thing to actually tell the truth <laughs> you know if if there's if you have a dichotomy where it's like it's either i tell the truth or i or i presume uh with presumption you know claiming or reading scripture I like how the devil tempted Jesus, right? Throw yourself down, for it is written, you know. He will give it his angels charge over you and all this stuff. Like just just presume. Just just quote it. Just blab it and grab it. Name it and claim it. Run it, you know, run just nosedive off of the uh, the pinnacle of the temple. Just do it, Jesus. No, that's presumption. That's pride. I do believe that there are many people who presume to be saved to be like right with God when they're not and they presume that because they're taught to presume that they're taught all you have to do is just quote unquote believe in Jesus whatever i mean you can, that can mean many things to many different people I've spoke, I have spoken to some very wicked, evil, and immoral people that say they're saved and that they, you know, they believe in Jesus, so they're all good and everything's all good and God is love and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but wait a second. You know, it also says in the scriptures, if you do any of these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we have to repent. And not enter into presumption. We should not be like fearful and you know paranoid and you know be insecure either, but we should not enter into presumption. Look at what it says in the book of Acts. Look how the apostles preached. They didn't say, oh, you know, just, just, just accept Jesus and all will be good. That's all you got to do. You don't have to repent, nothing else. You know, just, just claim your salvation. All you can do is say, bow your head and say this prayer and after, you know, repeat after me. And there you go. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're in the, you're, you're in the kingdom. Is that, how they, is that how they preached? Is that how they ministered to people? To me, I see a humble, a humble crowd. I, I see the apostles being humble, not assuming or entering entering into presumption but rather calling on people to repent and 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 to walk in the ways of God and to fear God to fear God you know we read this earlier the fear of the lord is is what drives us away from pride The fear of the Lord is what drives us away from pride. Proverbs 8.13 8, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate, says God. I think a lot of people do not preach the fear of God. And I'm not talking about like, you know, I think there's a healthy balance between the fear of God and the love of God. I think we need to know the love of God. We need to experience the love of God. But we also need to experience the fear of God. Because without that, we're like we're imba- like the spiritual imbalance. You know, we need to have the we need to have both of them in healthy proportions. So the church today, a lot of the church, I should say, it, it's not like oh, just um, you know, just believe in Jesus. That's it. You're saved. Go and praise God. Yeah, you're you're saved. That's okay. You're forgiven. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 22. 
pull this up here. Actually, let's just go there. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Acts 8, verse 22. This is what Peter, this is how Peter preached. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may, may be forgiven you. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. I, that's, that's, that's humility. That's not presumption. That's not presumption at all. That's humility. That's power. That's not pride. I mean, he could have said, repent therefore, or just, you know, say the sinner's prayer and praise God you're saved. Or just believe in Jesus, whatever that means to you, and praise God you're saved. You're all forgiven. You're done. You're, it's, you're forgiven anyway. No, it's like, no, repent. Number one, repent therefore of your wickedness, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. See, this is very much against the, quote-unquote, a lot of the faith, charismatic teaching that we have today. And I love this because this is like, this is, this is secure in humility. This is secure on the rock. Because you're not assuming anything. You're not claiming that you, you know, that God is some kind of gum machine that you put in a quarter and get the gum out. Like, no, it's like, Repent, pray, perhaps God will forgive you. Perhaps. That's amazing. So, that is the gist of it there. That's it for the teaching on humility. We actually we spoke about, it's like three hours, right? A good three hours of... Uh, of teaching here, going through the scriptures, both of direct commands on to humble yourself, as well as indirect commands like God gives, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We're, and then we have the, we had the examples such as Eve in the garden, um, Joseph, the, the humble, the humble servant, Naaman, Daniel, The temptation of Christ, the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, the parable of the uh, the wedding feast parable, take the lowest seat. James, we spoke about that. We spoke about Job, lots of stuff we spoke about. So we covered a lot of bases, covered a lot of bases. You know, it's so much on my heart. I wish that so I wish that the believing world today will get out of their little proud little cliques, their little social clubs that they call churches, and actually get serious with God and learn this stuff that we're talking about tonight. Today. Like seriously. Get serious with God. I'll tell you the truth. You know, they said certain things in the, during the, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to trigger any algorithms here, but for the past four years, you know, four years ago, three years ago, when the things were um, quite involved in the world, seen as what was going on in the world in, in uh, three, four years ago, they are talking a lot about false security. This provides a false security. That provides false security. That's false security. That other, you know what's false security to me? Church. Warning. Church gives you false security. Church gives you false security. How can, you might say, Christopher, how does that work? Because you got Joe Blow Sinner 
who is bound in enslaved to many sins he goes to he, he's got this idea i want to be a good i want to go into church now you know i want to get right or i want to just be you know this kind of believing guy that's kind of right with god i want to i want to be a little bit closer to god so i'll go to church so he goes to church and what does he hear just some like self-help guru sermon that is drizzled with a little bit of scripture here and there, maybe a prayer or two, a little bit of talk of God, but there's no experience with God there. No experience with God. No humility. No people going and falling on their faces before God in humility, crying out to God. No lives changed. It's just a pathetic little gossip written ridden club of sin that has its name as a church right nothing but a just just a club a social club drizzled with scripture to make it sound like a church to make it sound churchy or religious but it's not these people can be just as bad, if not worse, than the, other, than the people that don't go to church because of their hypocrisy. And because Joe Blow, sinner that's so full of sin and so enslaved to sin, he goes to church on Sunday morning. He listens to a pathetic sermon that he forgets by the time he gets to the door. Then... Everybody just like, oh, oh, you know, good to see you. Blessings, blessings. And, you know, the pastor shakes his hand and he feels all good. Like, yeah, I'm good now with God because everybody accepts me and, and everything like that. And yeah, walking out. So is does he walk out a changed man? Does he walk in a sinner and walk out a saint? No. Does he walk in enslaved to sin and walk out a free man? No. He walks in enslaved to sin and he walks out a man who is even more enslaved to sin because he is emboldened to sin because now I'm, I'm a little bit better. I go to church and the pastor never rebuked me for my, for my sin and he never talked about repentance and never even identified or defined or eradicated sin in my life. He never spoke about people's lives being changed by the power of God and ah, uh, so he's emboldened in his sin. Yeah, Sean says club of sin. Yes, exactly. Club of sin. He's emboldened in his sin because now he, now he, you know, there's the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, effect going on, right? The Dunning-Kruger where it's like at the very beginning when you learn a little bit of stuff, you learn, you learn a little bit and you think you know a lot. So this is confidence, Confidence level goes way, you know, sky high. I mean, you know, so this person will learn a little bit about God, learn a little bit about church, a little, a little bit of the hymns or the choruses or contemporary Christian music, whatever is going on in church, and learning a little bit about this, this verse or maybe a little bit about that verse, but that's about it. No real in-depth teaching. Nothing mentioned of repentance. Nothing mentioned of, of lives being changed. So he thinks that's, 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 what it, that's where it's at when it comes to church. He thinks that that is what God is all about. Because church represents God, doesn't it? At least it's supposed to. So he walks, so as he goes to church, he gets more and more emboldened in that cult of sin. He gets more and more emboldened in it. Because church gives him a false sense of security. He thinks he's okay with God, but he's far from God. He thinks he's okay with God because he's okay with the pastor and the pastor is okay with him. So therefore he's okay with God because the pastor represents God, right? But he's far from God. 
It's far from sin. Or I mean, far from, far from truth. Far from being righteous with God. So I think the greatest plague of the West today, the greatest plague of the Western world, is the hypocritical, sin-friendly, antinomian, anomian, Paulian church in which there is no power, in which there is no call for repentance, in which there are very few, if not if none, lives being changed, no lives at all being changed for the power and glory of God, just some cultural little family clique. And it's a pathetic, it's a pathetic excuse for a church. So I do believe that church leaders Pastors, bishops, priests, deacons, elders need to hear what we, did, what we were just talking about. They all need to hear it and be serious about it. Maybe some of you know of a pastor or a bishop or a priest or an elder or a deacon that you can send this link to, you can send this video to. The world needs it so much today. They really do. They really, really, really do. Okay, so I'm about, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here in a few minutes, guys. If you haven't already, please leave a like. If you're new here, subscribe, follow. As Regina says earlier here, subscribed, bells clicked. Awesome, awesome. This coming week, t starting tomorrow, uh, we are going to be doing a series on the Holy Spirit series on the Holy Spirit. Again, doing uh, similar to what we've done here with humility, but in, in much deeper uh, study. We're going to be going through everything from Genesis all the way through to the New Testament, talking about the Holy Spirit. What does it say? And people, uh, their experience, like how, how do you, can people get filled with the Spirit today? Are the gifts in operation today? Um, all this stuff. What about the Kundalini Spirit? All of this stuff we'll be talking about Lord willing, in the next few days to come. So make sure you're subscribed. And as Regina says, bells clicked. That way, when we go live, you guys know we're live. You can jump on in the live chat as well and um, you know, ask questions and uh, you know, share your, your thoughts and uh, share your knowledge and wisdom as well. I, I learn from you guys, and um, you know, it's my prayer that you guys learn from uh, what we talk about here as well. Yes. All right. Well, you know what? I feel like just praying what I usually pray in the, in the very beginning, which I have again, is just I pray that everything that we share here today, everything that we shared uh, was a great blessing to you. Increase your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of the things of heaven, your relationship with God, and your knowledge of the truth. Amen. 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 All right. All right. So Randy says, thank you, Christopher and the band. Everything was good. Thank you very much, Randy. Appreciate that. You guys are awesome. Craig says, thank you, Christopher. Blessings to you and your family. Thank you, Craig. Blessings, blessings multiplied back to you as well. All right. Tomorrow, Lord willing, it'll be 7 p.m. Eastern. 7 p.m. Eastern time. If you're, if you're in a different part of the world, uh, just look up New York time, okay? If you want to do a time, or just if, if you subscribe and you got the bells clicked, the YouTube will notify, notify you anyway. So you don't even have to convert the time if, you, if, that's, if, that's the, um, if that's the case. All right. Flo says, really enjoyed the music and live stream today. Christopher, thank you so much uh, to you and the band. See you all tomorrow. Thank you very much, Flo. Blessings multiply to you and yours. Seek the Lord says, thank you, Brother Christopher and everyone. God bless, you. God bless and see you tomorrow. Thank you, Seek the Lord. God bless you more. All right. As always, keep on, keep on pressing in. Keep on calling on him and he will show you great and mighty things. Jeremiah 33, 3. Love you guys. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you. 
and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. I'll see you guys tomorrow.